good morning to our online congregation. Now, welcome those of you who are new. Welcome to everyone who's here with us in person at the church. We are on Soul Ties Part 3. Today, I'm going to be touching on how to identify if you have a soul tie. So, identifying a soul tie, obsession, and demonic entity attachment. I want to first share this question that Brother Rick, uh, Brother Rick, Brother Richard, he is one and the same. He did confirm that to me. Hey, Brother Rick. Um, I want to share with you a question that he asked on part one. He said, can a person develop a soul tie and identify with an image or a person such as a superhero or a movie star? Some people wear superhero outfits have posters, and live a fantasy life as well as with movie stars. Thanks for this week's message. Now, this was my reply, and I said, that sounds more like idolatry, worshiping, worshiping that movie star or superhero, which is sin against God. The superheroes are the fallen angels and their fallout, their offspring, okay, the Nephilim, the Titans. Even if they want to be that person or superhero, that is still sin against God because they're not happy with who he created them to be. If they are in love with that movie star, then lust is involved. And all of these things are sin against God. It seems like an addiction and it will open doors to more demonic activity in their lives. When they are infatuated, with a movie star and all of that. I mean, that's idolatry and that's worshiping of, of people, right? When they're infatuated with wanting to be a, a superhero and that kind of thing, that's all, that's all sin against God. But those things are not soul ties, right? This is what I concluded with. A soul tie goes both ways. The other person would also have to be connected to them in some way to actually call it a soul tie. Otherwise, it is just a type of sin in that person's life, okay? A soul tie, there must be connection between the two people in some way. Not just that you start fantasizing or idolizing or worshiping somebody. That's not going to create a soul tie. There has to be connection between the two people. That's how their souls get tied up, okay? Now, uh, I will stop right here and take a moment just to give the warning again. This message is not for young children. This is a very sexually sensitive subject matter. And I would say it's for older teens and that you guys, um, you should be sure that your child understands this information at the right point and time in their lives, okay? Um, so you be responsible for getting this information to them or having them watch this teaching at the right time, okay? Um, they do need to understand what happens when they are physically, sexually intimate with someone. They need to understand that. They need to be taught biblically what God has to say about all of that, okay? because that's a big part of what this teaching is all about, okay? So we're going to go on. Now, last week, uh, I was teaching on the different types of soul ties, okay? They were unholy unions or perverse relationships, and that is like when two believers have sex together. And in that case, it doesn't matter if they were married or not, cheating or not. Because they're unbelievers, they both have the demonic active in their lives and they have the demons transferring back and forth freely. Okay? Uh, the next one, and, and even though I said it doesn't matter, all of that is still sin against God. Whether they're serving God or not, it's sin against Him. When they get saved and they come to Him, then they're going to learn that all of that was a sin against Him, okay? So no matter what, even if it's an unbeliever, those things are still sin against God, okay? Now, uh, the next one was a soul tie that is created through sexual assault, such as rape, molestation, um, any type of forced sex 
that's forced upon someone. Those are all sexual immorality soul ties created through that. And I briefly discussed, discussed the witch and her familiar because they have a soul tie going on with the demonic flowing back and forth, okay? Uh, the witch works with animals. Demons are in the witch. Demons are in the animals, okay, um, that she's working with. She is using those animals in her witchcraft. Whether it's the same demon or it's different demons, they move back and forth between the two and they work together toward common goals in carrying out the witch's witchcraft. Okay, that's why uh, when you see pictures of witches, you always see crows or you see the black cat or you see owls or you see bunny rabbits. You'll see whatever her familiar um, animals are because those familiar spirits are in those animals, okay? The witch also has demons in her. She's serving Satan, right? Okay, so, and obviously doing her witchcraft, she would be filled with demons, okay? All right, this goes for those who think they're practicing white witchcraft or Wicca because they try to present that as, oh, I do good things for people. You know what? Those people have demons in their lives because they're not seeking to God, and uh, many of them think they're, th they're saved and they're Christians. And God is against witchcraft in any form. Any form. So when they're practicing even the Wicca, even the white magic, even the good things, they have opened the door to Satan and they do have demons in their lives. And if they think they're only doing good things and they're working with God and they're really getting it done, they are deceived already. It's okay. Uh, you can also develop soul ties from close relationships that are not sexual. The sexual ones seem to be the deepest, the strongest kind, but there are other kinds. You can uh, create them from close relationships, and that's like having a very close friendship with a coworker, working closely with your coworkers or classmates at school or just a super close friend, you know, your best friend, your bestie, okay? a parent, etc. Somebody that you're close with, that you're not sexual with, you can have soul ties with those people, right? Um, you can develop soul ties through a commitment or a vow to another person. And remember the example of the godly soul tie between King David and Jonathan? They were best friends. They did have a godly soul tie. So in the same way, those same type of soul ties can be formed between ungodly people. And what that means is it's not the Holy Spirit that they have in common, but it's demons, okay? They're not sexual soul ties, but they are soul ties nonetheless. Um, and you think about it. When you have, you know, somebody that you're very close to, they hold sway and influence in your life. They influence your decisions. They influence the things that you do, okay? Um, and being very close like that, you know, always together, always, you know, discussing, you know, your life and your dreams and whatnot, um, there can very easily be soul ties there. Um, so those are different ways that soul ties can form even in those, you know, type of relationships that are not sexual, okay? Now, we're going to move on and we're going to discuss how to know if you have a soul tie, okay? How do you know if you have one, a soul tie? When a woman and a man have sex together, soul ties can be noticed when he or she has sex with different people and in their mind, they feel as if they are having sex with the previous man or woman, but not with the one at hand. So they're in this, you know, physically intimate moment with this person, and they're still thinking about the other person, the last person. That's who's on their mind, not this person, okay? 
So they're still fixated on the last one. They're over here with this one, but it's all about the other one, okay? Um, cases have been reported where while in the sex act, they call the name of the previous person, right? We've seen that in the movies when they're having their make-out scenes and whatnot, and then they slip up and they call the other name, and it's like, oops. That's telling, okay? That's telling. Um, they can't get their old lover out of their mind. They can't get this person off their mind. They're thinking about them all the time. No matter who, you know, who else they go on and be with, they're still thinking about this other person, okay? Um, they're obsessed with them. That's why I mentioned uh, that we would be touching on and talking about obsession. They are so obsessed with and infatuated with this person they can't get them off their mind. It's like they can't move on with their lives. They're stuck, okay? And these are the things that show if you have a soul tie with that person or not, with somebody back in your past, okay? With somebody back in your sinful days and your sinful life, right? These are the things, these are the telltale signs that tell you if you've got a soul tie with them. Are they always on your mind? Do you think about them in those physically intimate moments? Do you know? Do, are you just obsessed with them and stuck on them and like you follow their life and who are they with now and what are they doing and what, you know, are you keeping up with them behind the scenes? That kind of a thing, okay? Obsessed, infatuated with them. Um, you may be having dreams about them. Dreaming about them, you know, all the time. The person that they're obsessed with may also be showing up in their dreams all the time. You can be dreaming about them. They can be showing up in the dreams. When you notice this happening um, just, you know, I'll just say abundantly, frequently, more often than not, there's more than likely a soul tie there, okay? Um, we have, you know, random people that we've known in our lives. Yeah, they can show up in our dreams, come across our mind, and that kind of thing. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when it's just all the time. When it's, when it's so frequent that you know, you know, you should be bearing witness with what I'm saying if that's happening in your life. You're going to be like, yeah, so-and-so is like always in my dreams and that kind of a thing, okay? All right. Um, you've seen it in the movies. I saw this one before truly being saved and living an obedient life. This movie is rated R. That's why I'm saying that. <laughs> I don't watch these kind of movies anymore. But Fatal Attraction with Glenn Close and Michael Doug Douglas. He committed adultery with the character of Glenn Close. And after that, her attitude was, if I can't have you, Nobody can. She kept calling him and showing up where he was. She was wanting to be with him no matter what. She tried to commit suicide, to hang on to him, to get his sympathy and get him to stay with her. And that, that's desperation. That is a soul tie. She's trying to hang on to him no matter what. Don't want to let you go even to that degree, okay? She met with his wife under false pretenses, so the wife did not know that this was the woman her husband had had an affair with. He, she did not even know her husband had had an affair. So she, she arranged this little meeting, and the, and the wife of Michael Douglas in the movie was unaware that, that he had ever even been with this woman. And he was there too, and he was infuriated by these little games that she was playing you know what? Sin has consequences. It always does. It'll come back and bite you, okay? Um, so she met his wife under false pretenses, and she even managed to get away with picking his little girl up from school. Now, this woman was obsessed with him. She wasn't a friend of the family. She was not a relative. And she managed to go and pick his little girl up from school and then take her around and spend the day with her. Yeah. So, she was so jealous and angry about being shut out of his life 
that she boiled his daughter's little pet bunny rabbit to send a message. Oh, she sent it loud and clear. He already knew what he was dealing with. He stepped off in it when he got with this lady. So I will tell you, that movie pretty much nails what a soul tie looks like. It really lays it out and shows. He went off, had adultery, committed adultery with this woman, and then she was hanging on. She did not want to let him go. She was willing to any cost to get this man. That's a soul tie, okay? That obsession right there, all right? Now, as you think about that, if I can't have you, nobody can. Look at here, the Bee Gees. They had a song with the lyrics, if I can't have you, I don't want nobody, baby. Now look at their picture here. You think they're speaking to the brotherhood? They are. They are. You got the 666 and you got the Freemasonic hand on the chin. They are instruments of Satan. I think one of them is still alive, the main lead singer. But they were probably born and groomed up in Luciferic families. And that's why they were lifted up on the world stage. That's the ones you see in Hollywood. That's the ones you see in sports. That's the ones you see uh, in music, the music industry. They are all been born in Lucifer families, groomed up and rolled out because those are Satan's uh, mediums to reach us and try to get hold of us and try to draw us over to his side and draw us over into sin against God, okay? So I just thought I'd, I'd share that with you. But they had that song, okay? Um, there's a soul tie when you just can't get over the person. You know, your friends are telling you, you know, <laughs> he's no good for you, you know, dump that loser. Or, you know, or the, or the guys are saying, you know, man, get, get away from her, move past all that, right? So there's a soul tie there when you just cannot get over that person. Or you think you'll die without them. You'll go crazy without them or you'll do something drastic to get their attention and you'll, you'll do anything. You want to get them back at any cost. That has all the makings and shows all the symptoms and signs of a soul tie. Okay? Um, now look at this. Unusual signs of an unhealthy soul tie. Number one. You are emotionally and spiritually attached to somebody that you don't like and other people in your life deeply resent. Number two, you left the relationship years ago, but you can't stop thinking about them and missing them, which makes you anxious and depressed. Number three, you have a psychic connection and feel what they feel, like moods. Strangely, when you think about them, they contact you, and your chemistry is powerful. Now, I want to tell you something real quick. This was random information from online. When you look at the third point, just remember, this so-called psychic connection is nothing more than the demons that have passed back and forth that are keeping you connected with that person, okay? That's what that is. Now, but that, that's pretty, that gives a pretty good description also of how to identify a soul tie, okay? You're just really hooked in with this person, stuck on this person. And even the, the number one really made me laugh because even somebody you don't like and you're still, you just can't break it off, you can't get away from them, you, you can't, you know, your friends don't like them and there you are still tied to that person. You know, you really got to look at your friendships, look at your relationships. You got to really drill down on this stuff. And if you're a Christian now, you're living a righteous life. Think back to your sinful life. You think back to those, those things and see if any of that is still cropping up in your Christian life. Because if it is, there's a soul tie there that you're going to need to break, okay? Now, we're about to watch a video clip. This, uh, this is from the movie Wuthering Heights. Actually, it's from the book that they made into a movie, right? Um, it's the, the book was written by Emily Bronte. Now, I'll just say that God dropped this right in my lap. I mean, he really did. He just laid this one right out for me. It was amazing, the timing and everything. I mean, the moves of God are so amazing. And I had no idea this whole movie, this whole movie is about a soul tie. The whole movie is. 
Um, the characters, Kathy and Heathcliff, they are madly in love. And when I say madly, I mean madly, okay? Although they're not officially together as a couple because of their different statuses initially. Let's watch this clip and we're going to see an example of a soul tie played out on screen between these two. The clip begins with the character Heathcliff. He's brooding because Kathy is seeing someone else. Watch this, you guys. Half past eight on the holy hour. Doesn't he know, young fool, when it's time to go home? Well, that's Mr. Edgar now. Go and fetch his horse. Take these apples into the larder. Eh, hey, Lord. Spare the righteous and smite the ungodly. Oh, more than my own life, for belonging to her more than my own soul. Don't let her see me, Ellen. No. Ellen! I wonder whether you were still up. Has he gone? Ellen, I've got some news for you. Oh, the kitchen's no place for oh, that. Let's come into the parlor. Ellen, come here. Oh, Kathy. Sit down. Ellen, can you keep a secret? Ellen, Edgar's asked me to marry him. What did you tell him? I told him I'd give him my answer tomorrow. But do you love him, Miss Cathy? Yes, of course. Why? Why? That's a silly question, isn't it? No, not so silly. Why do you love him? Because he's handsome and pleasant to be with. And that's not enough. Because he'll be rich someday. And I'll be the finest lady in the county. Oh. And now tell me how you love him. I love the ground under his feet, the air above his head, and everything he touches. What about Heathcliff? Oh, Heathcliff. He gets worse every day. It would degrade me to marry him. I wish he hadn't come back. Oh, it would be heaven to escape from this disorderly, comfortless place. Well, if Master Edgar and his charms and money and parties mean him, do you? What's to keep you from taking your place among the Linton angels? I don't think I belong in heaven, Ellen. I dreamt once I was there. I dreamt I went to heaven and that heaven didn't seem to be my home. And I broke my heart with weeping to come back to earth. The angels were so angry, they flung me out into the middle of the heath, on top of Wuthering Heights. And I woke up sobbing with joy. That's it, Ellen. I've no more business marrying Edgar Linton than I have of being in heaven. But Ellen, Ellen, what can I do? Thinking of Heathcliff. Who else? He's sunk so low. He seems to take pleasure in being mean and brutal. And yet, more myself than I am. Whatever our souls are made of, his and mine are the same. And Linton's is as different as frost from fire. My one thought in living is Heathcliff. Ellen! He's so 
suffered, I suffered. The little happiness he's ever known, I've had too. Oh, Ellen, if everything in the world died and Heathcliff remained, life would still be full for me. He must have been listening. Okay, if the platform that you're watching from didn't show the clip, you can go to our website, threeheartschurch.org, to see the full message, including the video clip, okay? Um, now notice, he was so attached to her that he thrust his hands through that glass twice, inflicting personal, you know, self-harm on himself because he was so attached to her, crazy about her, madly in love with her, okay? And that's not rational, okay? Uh, then he stated to the maid that he needed Kathy more than his own life and that he loved her more than his own soul. That's not healthy. You know, uh, as Christians, equally yoked and married and in a, you know, a healthy, happy marriage, we love the other person, yes, but we don't love them even more than our own soul, more than our own life, you know. Oh, we, think, we have always thought those words are so romantic to hear things like that. But, you know, in this situation, you can clearly see it was not healthy. It's not godly, okay? The same was with her. She even stated that she was him, I mean, it was like, what? <laughs> That's because you're looking at a soul tie between these two people, okay? An ungodly union. Uh, they were so connected by the demonic that she felt like she was him. And if you go on and watch that whole movie, you will see that these, these two, they were not godly people. The things that they said, the thing, you know, they weren't godly. Okay, it comes through their speech. They make statements against heaven throughout that movie. I uh, thought it was interesting that she was sharing this little dream where she dreamed she went to heaven and she wasn't worthy of heaven and the angels kicked her out. See, that just goes to reinforce this demonic soul tie that she's got with this Heathcliff guy. And that was confirmation in that dream. You're not even a righteous person. You don't even belong here. Okay. Um, and they torture each other throughout the movie. And it's like they could not be together, but they were not happy apart either. And if you can't understand what a soul tie looks like, I'm telling you, go and watch that whole movie, uh, and you will have a much better idea. Go on, I mean, that one's cleaner than the um, Fatal Attraction, right? Fatal Attraction is rated R. This one... It's, you know, you don't have cussing, you don't have the sexual scenes, you don't have all of that, okay? It's a classic, it's an old black and white movie. Um, go dig that movie up, go watch the whole thing. It, it totally plays out a soul tie right on the big screen, okay? So that's a picture of a soul tie. If you could hear their talk, listen to what they were saying, Okay, that, that whole thing. It, and it just reminds me of that, um, that Tom Cruise movie. What was that movie where he was the agent and his job was going down the tubes and that Renee Zellweger character, her and him got together. You guys will know. Show me the money, that movie. Um, whenever, I forget which one said it, but they said, you complete me. You know what? We're complete all on our own. The other person, when we're together and we're married, then we're, we're seen in God's eyes, we're one, right? But we're also complete without being married. Some people, uh, their, their gift or their call in life, I don't know, like I'm not, getting my, uh, not putting my finger on the right word, but it's to just be single, like Apostle Paul was saying that he was, that he wished everybody would be like him because it's easier that way. Uh, not being burdened down with all the worries and cares of a family, the wife trying to please the husband, the husband trying to please the wife, and instead that person can just be focused on God. So um, anyway, we don't need anyone else to complete us. When two people get married, they do become one in God's eyes, okay? And one, as we've uh, stated, in the, in the flesh. 
and we're going we're gonna to bring more out about that. I'm going to bring more out about that probably next week. You're really going to get a good picture about what that really is saying, uh, what it really means for the two souls to tie up and to unite, because I'm really going to bring that out so you can get it better, okay? So let's move on. Let's talk about demonic entity attachment. Remember, we're now talking about how to know if you have a soul tie. Another way to know if you have one is if you have a spiritual attachment. So something that follows you or comes to you, and by something, I'm meaning something in the spirit realm, okay? Whether it's comforting or not, because it can manifest either way. And it's not Jesus. It's not the Holy Spirit. It's not a holy angel. And it's so that it, because it's none of those, it's not of God. Okay, you've got to test the spirits. What is this thing doing? What is this thing saying? How is this thing behaving? Okay, you better get to the bottom of it because God just doesn't come around and hang out. You're not so chosen, called, blessed, anointed, and whatnot that he's just coming and hanging with you all the time. <laughs> you need to learn that because there are certain people that try to portray and act like that in the Christian community, I'll say. And I'll tell you what, he doesn't act that way in my life. He doesn't act that way in Pastor E. Rustus or Pastor Dauber's lives. So if you've got somebody telling you that kind of stuff, what you're listening to is somebody that's got a familiar spirit that's active in their lives. Um, we learned about an example last week. Remember, I talked about the dog man that was following the lady around after she had been raped, after, the, after that traumatic uh, incident happened in her life. Then she had this dog man following her around. She was trying to tell everybody, oh, it's good. It's protecting me. It comforts me. Everybody needs this. That poor lady, uh, <laughs> if she's saved, she's not getting the right spiritual guidance and teaching. Okay, if somebody's not speaking into her life and letting her know, you need to deal with this and you need to break it off because it came in through that sexual violent act that was perpetrated against you by the one who did that to you, okay? That's a demonic attachment that came in to her life through trauma, okay? Now, if you have that kind of activity in your life, that is an indication of a soul tie. That type of thing, it can manifest from another type of sin also, but as we learned last week, it came in through trauma, through rape. Now, and because it was being nice to her for now, the woman thought it was a blessing. And I'll tell you what, she's being deceived. Remember, demons are seducing spirits. The demons, the devil, they're not going to show up and say, I'm a demon, I'm here to wreck your life. They're going to try to usually, I'll say usually, soften things down and be sweet and be seducing and be, right? Things you want to hear and be comforting and be all of this stuff, okay? Um, these demonic attachments usually want to seem nice and sweet. So you accept them and you don't take any action against them to get rid of them, to get them out of your life. They're not always nice, and they will show their true nature at some point in time. They will get down to business, okay? Um, and they can also wreck your life just from the whole uh, acting sweet and nice and, and doing whatever because they can move you in certain ways just by pretending to do that. They can still wreck your life through deception, even if it is acting like they're sweet and nice. They can ruin aspects of your life even through that. Um, you can also be so close to someone that there is a soul tie there. Like I said, you know, your best friend, a parent or whatnot, uh, and there is a soul tie there. And if they are visiting you or speaking to you, what you need to know and understand is it is not them. It is a familiar spirit, okay? 
Um, that is, a familiar spirit is a demon that is disguised as your loved one, as your friend, as your parent, as the person that you knew and, and loved, okay? Or even if you didn't love them. If you've got someone coming to you in your dreams or manifesting in your room, in your home, or in your life, that is not that person, so a, a person that's passed away. That's not them. That is a demon that is fronting as them, okay, to deceive you and to tear your life down, to tear it apart, okay? Um, you need to break that soul tie off. What you need to recognize if you have that happening in your life is that you need to get that out of your life. There are spiritual steps that you have to take, actively take. You have to grow you have to have knowledge about it. What is it? Because a lot of people are like, it's comforting to them. Oh, mama comes and sees me at night. She comes in my room and talks to me. And, then, and, you know, and mama's dead. Mama's been dead for years. But she's coming in your room and talking to you at night and this and that and whatever, right? She's telling you things to do. To, and, oh, you're comforted because you still have mom. She's still with you. That kind of thing. That kind of thing needs to be dealt with. Okay? That's what that's all about. Um, you need to break that off your life. And remember how we read uh, in Hosea how God said, my people perish for lack of knowledge. If you do not understand these things spiritually, sooner or later, that demonic entity, that familiar spirit, will cause harm to you, to your life. That is its motive, okay? Um, and also, that kind of interaction, uh, I gave a message on uh, tattoos. In that message, I talked about people whose uh, loved ones have been cremated, and they are keeping those ashes in their home. I believe there was at least one testimony in that message where the person uh, shared that, I, I believe it was their father, was coming to them. And it was because there was a link spiritually because those ashes were kept in their home. And so they were having this interaction and most of those people think it's comforting. It's not. Those, those ashes of the dead people uh, have no business being in your home or in your lives. We had a young lady come to the church who had a necklace. I guess this is one of the... See, Satan is always coming up with ways to defile the church, to defile Christians to make those links to where he can interact and he has control in their lives. We had a young lady come here who now it's a thing where uh, I've seen things where they'll make your dead loved one's ashes into beads, little balls and decorative things that you can keep around the house. Uh, hers was put into a necklace that she wore around her neck. I mean, just, just crazy stuff. There, there's just, <laughs> I tell you, the things that Satan comes up with, he's always working every angle he can think of to work. Those things are, are attachments. That's a line for him to come in and work and do, you know, uh, those kind of interactions in your life. Now, uh, and you need to get rid of those things. You need to get them out of your life, out of your home. You need to renounce it, ask forgiveness, plead the blood of Jesus. You need to go through the steps, okay? And that's the whole thing. When you have a demonic entity coming to you in the form of someone you knew and loved or maybe that you didn't, you need to take steps to break that off and out of your life. You need to have that ended, okay? It's not a good thing. And some people are like, oh, I'm being blessed by God. With No, <laughs> God doesn't have a dead person lingering around all the time just to comfort you. Where is that at in Scripture? No. No, okay? So, there is a, talking about demonic entity attachment as a clue that you have a soul tie. So if that familiar spirit of whoever is coming in, in your room or coming into your life and talking to you and interacting and all of that, there is a young woman in Pastor Eressus' church who was a Muslim, She's saved now, and I mean, praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for her salvation. Her grandmother is the old, powerful witch 
who has been trying to kill Pastor Erustus. That's her grandmother, okay? And I've given, uh, you know, I've, I've shared what he shared about all of that so we could learn and grow about the spirit realm and what, what happens spiritually through all of this, right? So you have to understand that there is power on the dark side, on the wicked, evil side of things. They have power. There's so many people that, that walk around, they're so deceived. They're in Satan's clutches when they're talking like this. Satan don't have no power. He can't do anything. He can't. Uh, hello? I'll tell you what, after every strong and powerful deliverance that happens in Pastor E. Russ's church, he is retaliated against by Satan. Normally, he's taken down in his health. And sometimes it can be for weeks or even a month. Now, Satan does have power. These witches, these ones who have studied long and hard occultic things, dark, evil, wicked things, they have power. Okay? They're being endued with power from Satan. Okay? He's the prince of the power of the air. He does have power. He does have a kingdom. He does have servants in the spirit realm and in the natural realm. Okay? Okay? Now, so there's power on the dark side. And this old witch has killed people with her black magic. She has raised people from the dead. Not Christians. Wicked people. She has raised from the dead. This is how deep and dark her magic is. Her witchcraft. Her sin against God. Okay? Um... Her granddaughter was being groomed up to take her place. They are going to pass that evil, wicked anointing on to the next one. They're going to pass their knowledge on to the next one. They're going to pass their demons on to the next one. They're going to pass their animals with those familiar spirits in them, demons in them. They're going to pass on to the next one. They're going to raise up another one to take their place to keep doing Satan's bidding in that area. To keep that control, that power, that darkness going there. She was being groomed up to take her grandmother's place. Listen to this. They drugged her. This was uh, when she was a young teenage girl. They drugged her, and they arranged for her to be raped by her father. Now, he would not do it. So they got her cousin to do it. It's my understanding it had to be someone in her family line, and it would have been more powerful for it to have been her father. But he wouldn't do it, and I do at least praise God for that. I don't believe he was saved, but... Now, when they did this act to her, she was filled with demons. You see how that works? They knew that. She was a virgin, she was innocent, and they did this sexual perversion against her, and she was filled with demons. They wanted her to be filled with demons so that she could begin to work all of this dark wickedness in the area that she could begin to be trained up by her grandmother powerfully to do the same kind of wicked things, okay? So this act happened to her. It's another example of sexual trauma in someone's lives being used to bring the demons in. It took Pastor Erustus over two years to get that young woman delivered over two years and then how that is is that they went through deliverance and so many demons were cast out and they were speaking out they were telling him all about the old witch and things that she was doing and animals that she had and all kinds of things let alone her granddaughters because both of her granddaughters got saved and their mother i mean that family got saved but the and the old witch was mad about it that's why part of why she's coming against pastor erustus let alone the work that's being done for the kingdom of god in that area has everything stirred up and the witches hate it okay so when she would attend church after their initial deliverance Demons would manifest, and as they would manifest, then pastor would know there's still more work to be done. And so they just continued on this path of delivering until finally 
she has gotten free. And I mean, I praise the Lord Jesus for that. They, um, that was severed. That old witch and her passing that on down the family line got broken. She's not going to pass that on to her granddaughters. She's not going to pass that on to her daughter. They all got saved. Look what God can do. He is all powerful, all powerful. And I'll tell you something. The Luciferians have gone deep into dark things that we don't even understand. They're, they're out ahead of us on, on this kind of stuff. I mean, we don't get into all that, right? But we need to have an understanding about it, what they're doing and how they operate. And the church on the whole, clueless, all that stuff don't even happen. We don't know. That's an Africa thing. That don't happen here in the United States, and that's a lie. That is a lie. It may not be as open, but you better believe it's going on at high levels for sure. So it is time for us to wake up and know the truth. And I will say this. Even though I have said the dark side has power, Satan has power, the demons have power, those witches have power, and all of this kind of thing, Satan has power, and he empowers those that serve him. However, he will never have more power than Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the one who created him. You ain't never going to be more powerful than the creator. Never, never. He ain't never going to defeat, never have more power than Jesus Christ. And we have more power. We have all authority and power over Satan. He's under our feet because Jesus Christ died to give us the victory and set us free. Through Jesus Christ, we are more than conquerors. And the Bible says we trample on ser serpents and scorpions, and Jesus told us nothing of the enemy by any means will harm you. So I praise God for that, okay? So I just want to be clear. I do understand that Satan does have power. He does come and attack the true saints of God. Um, you know, we're always having to dodge those fiery darts. We're always having to go through tests and trials and all of these things. But he will never be more powerful than the one that we serve. God is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present, okay? So just remember that we are hooked into the true power source, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, in closing, I just want to say that soul ties can have different strengths. They can be weak or they can be very strong. Those two examples we gave today would be very strong, like the, what was played out in Fatal Attraction, the character of Glenn Close. That soul tie was very strong in her life. He was like done. He was like, I'm over it. I, you know, I don't want no more, no part of this. But she did. She was like, I want you back. I'm going to get you no matter what I have to do. Okay? Um, the, those other two crazies, Heathcliff and Kathy, <laughs> very strong between the two of them. That was a very strong soul tie, okay? So, and I want you to remember also, talking about them being weak or strong because we're talking about the demonic. That's what that is. The demons passing back and forth between these two people who were connected in ungodly ways, right? And so, Satan has a military. God has a military. If you're truly born again, baptized into the Holy Spirit, covered in the blood of Jesus Christ, you've come and surrendered your life to him, you're in the Christ. Uh, you're in Christ, but you're in his military. We're soldiers in the army of Christ, okay? Um, so just the same way God has a military, you know, you hear about uh, Michael, the archangel. You hear about cherubims. You hear about these different uh, levels with his angels. It's the same thing with his servants, with his children, okay? Uh, there are levels. There's a hierarchy in God's military, there is a hierarchy in Satan's military. He has a military also. A hierarchy of demons. There are weaker demons at the bottom levels, let's say, going up, building up to stronger demons. Okay? So some witches, let's just put it this way, some of them that are just starting out, they are trying to use, control, and manipulate lower-level demons. Okay, maybe they get the lower level ones assigned and they're learning and growing or whatnot. 
the more blood sacrifices, the more wicked, perverse things that they're doing and whatever, they're coming up the ranks, okay? And remember, we don't fight against flesh and blood. So we're not fighting a person in the physical. It's the demonic. It's Satan and his demons who are working through in and through their lives. Okay, so Satan has a hierarchy of demons. There are low-level ones building up to stronger, to Satan himself, right? Okay, the stronger person in a soul tie situation, the stronger person is able to control and influence the weak person to sin, to do things they normally wouldn't even consider doing. Through soul ties, they will make you do things against your will, Sin, perversions, transgression, and even unnatural and unspeakable acts. When someone has that kind of control over another person, that it's demonic, wicked control, they will have them doing all kind of wicked, sinful, ungodly, perverse things. The strong soul ties will rob you of your strength. They'll keep you committed to the relationship even though you know you shouldn't be with that person anymore or even though you know that's not a, a healthy friendship, relationship, what, what, however it is, whether it's sexual or not. If it's a very strong soul tie, it'll keep you committed to it till you learn and grow in Christ and figure out you need to break that off, right? Okay. Demonic soul ties will create perversions of good, holy, and sacred things of God. That's what it's all about. That's what those demons are there to do. Keep you in sin against God. Destroy, wreck, tear down your life. Ungodly soul ties are yokes around your neck. Just think about having a rope around your neck and being led around in bondage because those ungodly soul ties are yokes right around your neck, choking, choking you, right? Let's look at John 8, 36. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. That is, you shall be truly free. And I'll tell you what, real freedom comes through Jesus Christ. When I got saved, he broke things out and off of my life uh, from the very beginning that I didn't even know at that time that I needed to be praying about or seeking him about or anything. He just went, he goes to work in your life. At the point of salvation, the point of salvation is the greatest point of a deliverance in a Christian's life because the Holy Spirit comes in and he starts booting that ungodliness out. And whatever is left that remains, then God wants you to grow in those areas and learn and recognize and go, hey, I need to deal with this. I'm still having this problem in my life or this or that or what, right? And I need to get it out. Okay, God grows us up. He strengthens us. We pass through tests and trials all the time, getting stronger in, in the faith, in Christ, in the word of God as we walk with God, right? Okay, let's look also at John 10.10. 10. I don't have a lot of scripture this week because this, uh, you know, this is such a biblical teaching that we need to get. And it's, it really is, it's based on all the sexual sins against God mostly. And it's based on uh, not doing the things that God told us to do in our relationships, okay? Um, let's go to John 10.10. 10. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly, have it to the full, or that is a rich and satisfying life. Now, and that doesn't mean riches, like I'm going to get a bunch of money. It means you're going to have a rich, a full and a satisfying life, okay? That's exactly what Jesus is doing through this teaching. He is setting people free. We are getting the knowledge and we're learning about this subject so that we can break it off and out of our lives and get truly free in Christ. And he's helping us to break free from that sin that has strangled and hindered so many of our lives. I know there's going to be you guys out there that identify with this and you're going to recognize it in your own lives, okay? Okay. I praise God he's using this ministry to equip the body of Christ to know and understand what's going on in this world 
to understand spiritually the consequences of our sin, to understand spiritual things better and learn how to be set free. And in the last part of this teaching, I am going to be teaching how to break off ungodly soul ties to break that connection and get those things out of your life, okay? So um, I'm going to be back on the different kind of, uh, recognizing different kind of soul tie attachments. Next week, we're going to pick up where we left off here, okay? So let's go to prayer, you guys. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Heavenly Father, so much for the Word of God, the Word of God that's a lamp to our feet and a light to our path that teaches us and shows us the right way to go, the right way to live, how to live righteous lives. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for teaching us your Word through the power of your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for these deep truths that you're revealing to us, Heavenly Father. You don't want your church in bondage to Satan. You want us to be completely set free. You don't want us to live those defeated lives that we see so many people burdened down, not understanding why they came to Jesus and they still feel like they're still not set free. I thank you, Father, for showing us the truth. And Jesus Christ is the truth. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through Jesus Christ. And dear Lord Jesus, well, I thank you so much for the blood you shed to redeem each and every one of us who will come to you and believe in you. Lay our lives down, submit, and surrender fully to you. You are King of kings and Lord of lords. You are the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And I praise you, Heavenly Father. You are sovereign. You reign. You are over all things. And you knew the end from the beginning. I magnify you, dear Heavenly Father. You are the Lord God Almighty. I praise your holy name, Father. Dear Heavenly Father, Katrina, she is a school teacher here in Texas, and she was asking for prayer. She was asking for prayer. Um, the school system seemed like they have just become a circus. She said it's not even about education anymore. It just seems to be about keeping yourself healthy and keeping yourself safe. So I'm sure the masking and just all of the vaccine push and all of the things are continuing and it's just chaos in the school systems here in the United States. Uh, Yolindi did share that in South Africa they're, they are not having all the nonsense there. They're not having to wear masks. They're not having a social distance. They're not doing all those things. However, they are keeping the children separated out on the playground or not allowing them to play even though they sit close together in seats. Some of them are doubled up in certain type of desks, and then they ride together uh, on the, the transportation going to the school. They sit close, but yet they can't play close. So they still have just a little bit of craziness continuing there. Heavenly Father, I just want to lift this all up to you. Lord, I pray that uh, you will be with your children through the, the, the school year, Heavenly Father, some, you know, children have already started back. Um, we're on different systems and cycles uh, around the world, but I pray, Father, that you would be with your children while they're attending school, Heavenly Father. Please keep them safe, Lord. I pray that you would help them to study the material. I pray, Lord, that you would open their minds and help them to retain the information and to understand it, Lord, and to really get it. I pray, Father, that you would help them to pass their quizzes and their tests and their exams, Heavenly Father. I pray that you would help them to excel in their studies and in their schoolwork. Lord, I pray that you would give the teachers patience. Lord, help them to have patience and, and help them, Lord, to have mercy and compassion for their students just like you do for your children. Lord, I pray for the nonsense to... Uh, be taken out of the schools, Heavenly Father. I pray that, you know, we could just use common sense just like we always used to, that people who are sick, whether it's a teacher or a student, would just stay home. We don't need all the other 
uh, inflicted on everyone and all these rules about all of these uh, new weapons, really, that the Luciferians are trying to shake up the school system with all of this chaos. Heavenly Father, I pray for it all to calm down. I pray, Lord, for it not to be such a burden on the teachers and the students, Lord. I pray, like Katrina had mentioned, I pray that it could just get back to really educating the students and get back to what we thought was normal. I'm praying for all of this to be taken out of the school system, out of the situation, Father. And I just pray, Lord, that you will bless the teachers and the students in this school year, Lord, and that they would have a good school year and an easy school year, Lord. I pray that things would go well on both sides. Lord, I want to lift up to you. Um, Chad had asked for prayer a while back for his mother. She would had a massive stroke and um, was addicted to drugs. And from what I can understand, she doesn't, seem or hasn't seemed to be a saved woman and i just pray heavenly father that is your main concern first of all is for every soul to be saved that's why you're that's why jesus is tarrying so that more souls can be saved and come to repentance and not perish but have everlasting life so i want to lift up Nettie to you heavenly father and i pray for those listening who are not saved, I pray for their salvation. I pray for their family and some friends who are not saved, Lord. We pray for those who are still redeemable in this world, Father. I pray for their salvation. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would draw them by your Holy Spirit to Jesus Christ. I pray that you would open their spiritual eyes and ears and understanding. I pray that you would press on their hearts, Heavenly Father, and draw them to Jesus. I pray that they would really make a commitment and submit their lives to Jesus Christ. That they would have a hunger, a desire, a thirst for righteousness, for the word of God, for Jesus. We pray for their salvation, Heavenly Father. I pray for this woman to be saved, Lord. And her son, Chad, is uh, wanting to know what your purpose is for his life. He wants to know what his gifts and talents are. Heavenly Father, I pray that for everyone listening. If they still don't know what, what you created them to do in life, what gifts and talents you've blessed them with, right along beside Chad, I lift them up to you, Father, and I pray that you would show them and make it clear. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would lead them and show them what you've created them to do. I pray that you would help them to do all the good works that you created for them to do long ago, Lord. You created the good works for us. Help them to walk in them, Lord. Please show them what their gifts and talents are, Heavenly Father. Help them to get busy for your kingdom and your glory. And I pray, Heavenly Father, I, I lift my hands towards the online congregation, Lord Jesus. You're our Savior, Lord, and King. You're my Savior, Lord, and King. I'm serving on your altar, Lord Jesus, and I'm praying for your healing power to flow out right now and touch those who have faith to believe for their healing to manifest. They're hoping to be healed. They know what the word of God says. They know the word of God says by Jesus' stripes we are healed and we were healed. And they're praying and believing and hoping for that healing to manifest. Lord Jesus, I pray for your power to flow out. I pray in your mercy that you would touch Nettie. I pray that you would heal her from that stroke. I pray, Lord Jesus, you would heal the ones believing for a healing. I pray, Lord Jesus, for these healings to manifest. I pray that you would continue to strengthen Pastor Erustus. He's been really sick lately, really weak. I pray that you would strengthen him. I pray that you would touch Pastor Dauber and completely restore him and help him to heal up quickly from his hip replacement. Lord, I pray for his family to be healed my family to be healed. I pray, Lord, for all the, the flock you've entrusted to me. I pray for their healing, Lord Jesus. I lift them up to you. We're reaching out to touch the hem of your robe, to touch the hem of your garment. We're praying for virtue, for that power to flow out from you, Lord Jesus. And touch us, Lord Jesus. I pray for our healings to manifest, Lord. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that no weapon raised against us will prosper in your name because we are blood-bought, redeemed children of the Most High and living God. 
no sickness, no weapon, no anything that Satan has formed against us is not going to overpower. It's not going to take us down because we belong to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would strengthen us. Please strengthen the body of Christ. I pray, Father, that you would bless our finances. Please help us to make it through this financial crunch that the Luciferians are perpetrating on the world. Please strengthen us and help us to keep the faith, Heavenly Father. Help us to go deeper in our faith, deeper in Christ, higher up to you, Heavenly Father. Help us to draw nearer to you, Father. I pray that you would bless Three Hearts Church congregation, Father. Bless those who are praying for this ministry, for the outreach ministries, who are praying over the prayer request at the end of the messages each week. Please bless the ones who send encouragement and share encouragement to us, Father. Please bless those who are cheerful givers, Lord. I pray that you would press it down, shake together, and let their cups overflow in blessing back to them all that they have done for this ministry, Father. I pray, Lord, that the peace, your peace, would rule and reign in their hearts and homes and their lives, Lord. I pray for your blessing to be poured out on them. I pray, I plead the blood of Jesus Christ over the congregation. I pray a wall of fire around them, a hedge of protection around them, Father. I thank you for protecting them and blessing their lives, Lord. I pray for more of your anointing in their lives. And I pray, Heavenly Father, for more of your Holy Spirit in their lives. And I thank you, Father, for hearing and answering this prayer. And all praise, glory, and honor goes to you and you alone. And I magnify you, Heavenly Father. I love you, Father. And I pray all of these things in your beloved and only begotten Son's name. In Jesus Christ of Nazareth's name, I pray. Hey, you guys. I just want to take a minute to um, let's go through how to pray the prayer of salvation, okay? And why? Why do we even need to pray the prayer of salvation, okay? And also, I'm talking to the people also who maybe walked with the Lord and you went away from him and you just kind of left it behind and you haven't really been walking with Jesus anymore um, though that's what we call backsliders I'm talking to both the person who wants to be saved for the first time ever and to the person who's a backslider who wants to come back to Jesus because this ministry does not believe in once saved always saved okay God does his part and we do our part it's a team we work together all right so the first thing is you might say and I hear this a lot and even my husband was saying it to be honest with you before we got truly saved I'm a good person you know I haven't killed anybody that's kind of the standard these days as long as you haven't killed anybody you're a good person really listen to this the Bible says for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God that's Romans 3 23 all of us have sinned to be honest with you because the world is in a fallen state we all are born into sin, okay? And also for the people that think, but I'm a good person, I'm good, I haven't hurt, I don't hurt nobody, I do good things, I help people. That, that person, then uh, there's scripture in Isaiah that says for our righteousness, that's when we're calling ourselves good and we're saying, but we're good, we're good people. Our righteousness is as filthy rags to God. That's that thing that stinks that you're like, ooh, get it out of the house, right? Filthy rags to him. Okay, and he's the standard. He's the judge, Jesus Christ. And so the thing is, if we don't, if we miss his mark and we don't please him, we're not going to make heaven. So we want to make sure we got our ducks all in a row, right? And uh, if you look at the Ten Commandments, now we're not a legalistic church. We know we're under grace, which is what Jesus Christ brought. But there's people that say, you know, like I don't need Jesus. I'm I'm doing the Ten Commandments. Well, if you just pull out the simplest one, I'm just going to pull out one. You shall not lie. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, okay? That's what lying is. And if you say, I, oh, I don't lie, that's a lie. Everybody lies. Little kids come out lying. You say, did you do that? Did you break this? No, not me. Bam. So come on, you know. Um, so here's the thing. We've all broken uh, at least one of the commandments. And in the New Testament, it says if you break one, you broke them all. 
because that's the attitude of God. He's like, if you break one, it's just as good as breaking them all because that's all it takes to separate you from him as one. Okay, so let's pray that prayer of salvation. It's real easy to do, y'all. You just say, dear Jesus, please forgive me of all my sins. Please come into my heart. I believe you died on that cross for me, and I believe you rose again, and you are seated at God's right hand. Please help me to live for you all the days of my life, and thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Now, that prayer, you prayed to Jesus in his name. The rest of them, you're going to pray to the Father in Jesus' name. Okay? And you'll get all that as you learn and grow in the Spirit. Okay? Um, to see why you needed to pray that prayer of salvation, the scripture on that is Romans 10, 9 and 10. That'll show you about confessing with your mouth and believing in your heart and, and how to obtain salvation in case you're wondering how come we're doing that, okay? Um, now, something that you're going to want to do, you want to right off the bat start establishing your relationship with Jesus, okay? And in order to do that, you want to hear his voice, right? You want to hear him. I don't know a person out there that's trying to be a Christian that doesn't want to hear his voice. And how you hear his voice read his word that's his words written down for you and I to read that's his voice speaking to you without a shadow of a doubt okay then when you pray you speak to him so what's that that's two-way communication you're speaking to him he's speaking to you now you've got a relationship going okay and you want to do that every day Every day, seek him. You seek him by reading his word and praying and letting him know, I want more of you. When you read the Bible, ask him to open your spiritual eyes and your spiritual ears and to give you understanding. And he'll help you understand his word, okay? He wrote it by Holy Spirit, okay? And the next thing that you're going to want to do is get in a good Bible-based church. Now, I'm not pushing any kind of denomination. You just want to find a church that is preaching and teaching the whole Bible, okay? They believe in the Bible, and they believe in Jesus Christ, that he is God and the Son of God, okay? And that it's through him that we have our redemption and our salvation. He's the way, the truth, and the life, okay? And also, um, I wanted to say that some people think, oh, I just pray for forgiveness one time and I'm done because he died way back when. So now that I ask, it's all already done. No, you need to ask forgiveness and try to make it a habit on a daily basis because we're in these fleshly bodies before we get our glorified bodies. So we battle this flesh daily. So just, you know, when you pray each day at some point during the day, say, Lord, please forgive me for all my sins and go on about your prayer. And he knows you're praying and you're talking to him from your heart. And you talk to him just like you and I would talk, okay? You don't have to have fancy whatever, all right? And ask him to help you grow spiritually. If you want to, let us know that you prayed that prayer. It would be such a blessing to hear your testimony, okay? God bless y'all.